you turn back with me in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians 6. And we are, as I mentioned, we're completing a series or finishing a series on the armor of God, which we started um, a number of weeks ago. Now, um, the last in the armor of God that we'll be looking at then is in verse 17. Um, Paul says we should take the sword of the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, uh, this is this 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 particular uh, item on the armor of God stands out because it's the one item that is, uh, if you want, offensive. Every other in the armor of God seems to have a sort of defensive element to it: the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of gospel feet of, of gospel peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. They seem to imply that God is helping us stand by allowing us to take the proper defensive position against Satan's attacks. Whilst this is the sword of the Spirit, and of course that seems to have a more offensive sense sense to it. It's the means by which the soldier engages in combat. I don't know that we we shouldn't make too much of that initially, especially because I don't think the point of Paul's words in Ephesians 6 is for us to find direct correspondence with every single uh, ele- military element that he employs. For example, later in 1 Thessalonians, Paul can speak about a breastplate, breastplate of love, you see, and a breastplate of hope. Paul's essential point is that the Christian knows that we're engaged in warfare, um, more than anything, and that these are the vital things that we must hold fast to, and we must, if you want, we must arm, uh, arm ourselves with, as believers who are seeking to live faithfully and to live victoriously in our warfare against Satan. But I, there might be a suggestion that we should play, pay some close attention to Paul's choosing of um, this particular element to be the sword. Because what Paul calls the sword, not just the sword, but the sword of the Spirit, in verse verse 17, sorry, is the Word of God. Right? And so, why does Paul choose that? Well, one, then, it's because Paul is probably alluding to the Old Testament imagery that probably provides the basis for his words here anyway. In Isaiah chapter 11, which we just read, um, God's word is, the word that comes out of God's mouth is like a a sword. You know famously in Hebrews as well um, how God's word is referred to as a sword. So Paul is probably borrowing on that imagery. So as he begins to speak about the various ways in which the Christian is engaged in spiritual warfare, it's almost expected that if he was to compare anything to a sword, it would be the word of God. It's representative of how this is, this is uh, described in earlier portions of the scripture, in the scripture, entire, in the scripture itself. And, and that's really because of the nature of what the word of God is, right? Right? Um, Very likely here, as well as in Isaiah chapter 11, which we read earlier, God's word has this powerful effect of of judgment. So if you read Isaiah chapter 11 properly, what God's word does is it judges God's enemies. So it's almost as though the implication is that as much as God's enemies cause a lot of uproar, and they make a lot of noise, and they appear to be quite strong, God is able to destroy them with just a word. Martin Luther says something similar in his famous hymn, uh, Mighty Fortresses Are God. One word from God, he says, will, will 
Baal will topple Satan. So um, the, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The way God defeats the enemy is just by speaking a word, speaking his word. No more is required. Of course, God's word is powerful. God's word is powerful. Um, and so the sword of the Spirit is the word of God because God's word has this element, it, it's, it's powerful, and it, it, it causes, proclaims judgment upon the enemy. And so it's rightfully the sword. It's, and, and so most likely, Paul does want us to think about the fact that in the warfare against Satan, not only can we rejoice in the fact that we are protected from him, that there is enough in the armor of God to keep us from Satan, to make sure that he doesn't have his way with us and he doesn't accomplish his schemes. But actually, for us to remember that our ability to resist Satan, for one, is already indication that we are going to have the victory over him. So we resist Satan because our defense is impenetrable. It's, it's God himself, and God cannot be uh, defeated. But not only are we going to stand firm and not be defeated, we will, also, we will win. And so Paul introduces the sword of the Spirit to remind us that not only will we be able to resist or flee from Satan, we're going to overcome the kingdom of darkness. And we here is the church. Of course, as individuals, it applies to us as well, and we belong to the church, but the church will overcome. If you belong to, if you belong to the church of God, you've not only come to a place that is a refuge, and where you are shielded from Satan, you also come to the place alone where Satan will be defeated, the people through whom, uh, because Jesus is the head of the church and we are his body, we're going to have victory over Satan. Of course, it's called here the sword of the spirit. And if you have your, um, well, I think, I, I imagine that in most English versions, the spirit there is capitalized, it's the S is capitalized, right? This capital S spirit. And that's to indicate that it's the sword of the Holy Spirit that's being referred to here, as opposed to just a spiritual sword. But I know it's the sword that is not identical with the Holy Spirit, but it's a sword that is empowered, energized by the Spirit, so that who has victory over Satan? Yes, we have victory, but only because we are in Christ, who is um, the one who pours out his Holy Spirit. Only because the Lord Jesus has the Holy Spirit without measure. And so, again, we remind ourselves that the victory is ours only through God. And God is the one who fights for us as much as we engage in battle. It's really God who fights for us so that we don't become careless about how we approach spiritual warfare, assuming we have any strength of our own or assuming that this panoply of um, weapons is to make us boast or become prideful or become careless. No, it's God who gives us the victory. It's the sword of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul tells us that there is this aspect that we should remember to spiritual warfare where actually we are we're taking over. We are, we're the, you know, the church, the presence of the church in the world is to destroy the works of the devil. And that's bound to be the case because the church is the body of Christ. The Bible says Christ was, he was manifested to destroy the works of Satan. So the, every, every time you see the people of God gather anywhere, anytime there's a gathering of the church in any location, one of the things they are doing is destroying the works of the devil. Satan's works are being destroyed. That's why you can imagine that he, he must oppose things like missions, he must oppose the planting of churches and so on, because he knows the presence of the church in the place signals his 
demise. Well, whether he knows it or not, it's the case. When the church is present, Satan's hold is being destroyed. The sword of the Spirit. But remember that. How, why, how, do we, how is the church destroying the works of Satan? Because we have the sword of the Spirit. So, yes, the church's presence signals that. But specifically, Paul tells us here, it's because the church is equipped with the sword of the Spirit. And Paul tells us it's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. So, the church does destroys the works of Satan. The church destroys the kingdom of darkness. The, choice, the church proclaims and signals and spreads Satan's defeat. You know, the Lord will finally crush him um, in the world to come, right? On the last day, when Christ arrive, uh, returns, there will be a final destruction of Satan. But even now, Satan is constantly taking else. He's constantly being defeated. God will finally crush him, but he crushes him even now. Rejoice in that over and over again. We see God crushing Satan through his church, defeating Satan, um, his church being his instrument. And um, <clears throat> it's because the church has the word of God, that's the sword of the spirit, is the word of God. Paul says, if the church takes the word of God, we will continue to see Satan's malicious ways being overturned. But we must, you know, the, 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 the verb there is you must take, you must take the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. What's the word of God? I think most likely when you think of how Paul uses this terminology himself. Word of God usually refers to the preaching of the gospel, the proclamation of the gospel. Not so much the Bible, although we don't need to make any false dichotomies, but not so much as though Paul was saying, more specifically, it's probably the proclamation of the gospel, the preaching you know, of the gospel. That's how Paul would use that phrase. And it's possible also to even be more specific, although this is maybe not something to be dogmatic on, yet I think we get a hint that this is the case, and I'll show you in a moment with Paul's closing words. There's two words that Paul often uses that could be translated as word here. You see when you see the word of God? One is logos. Logos is the typical word for translating um, the, the Greek word that we translate as word, so the word of God, the logos of God. But another word is rema. And the, 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 the Greek word for rema, the, 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 the possible distinction there is that when Paul speaks about, when the word that's translated word of God is the Greek rema, that it's usually the spoken word, the preached word. Nothing more than that, by the way. Don't let anybody take you into all kinds of strange um, strange uh, things, strange spirituality, because apparently the Greek means something deeper. It doesn't mean much more than the fact that logos usually represents, you know, the, the word, the word substance. So, word, so, so logos can be word, it can be like substance. Um, yeah, it can, it can mean like almost like a thought, like an ideal, so you have the logos of something. But rema usually means the word when it's being spoken, preached, proclaimed. If that's the case, and the Greek word here is rema, if that's the implication, when Paul says that the sword of the Spirit is the word of God, he's referring to the preached word. So the, the sword of the Spirit is the word of God when it's being preached. That's how the Spirit attacks that's how the Spirit defeats the kingdom of darkness. How he defeats Satan's plans is by the word preached as a church. Um, and maybe the hint we have that this is the case is what Paul, Paul's prayer point. You know, after he tells them the armor of God and he tells them to continue to pray, 
He then has a prayer point, and Paul's prayer point is that the words may be given to me, verse 18, in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. So the Paul's prayer point probably might hint that that's what is on his mind here. But anyhow, so if that's the case then, the way the church destroys the works of Satan and breaks his chains, the chains by which he has bound people and overturns his malicious intent and liberates people is in the proclaimed word. Listen, the point here is not so much to isolate preachers or pastors as being of significance. This is a collective effort of the church. Yes, it is often spearheaded by men who are called to preach, elders, teachers, and so on and so forth. Yes, we have church leaders who are called to preach the word, but it's the activity of the church. Preaching is the activity of the church. However the church does it, whether it's on a Sunday like this or whether it's in our Bible studies, the proclamation of the word of God, whether it's on an open air, whether it's in a church conference, Singles conference, women's conference, whatever. The proclamation of the word, the preaching of the word is a church event. It's an activity of the church. It's a church effort. It's our sword. It's how we fight. And um, the reason why that's the case is because when we preach the word, God's word faithfully, and we proclaim the gospel, we expose Satan's tactics. We, we expose Satan's strategies. You know, in another portion of Scripture, Paul would have said, um, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God. They pull down strongholds. They expose the deceptions, the imaginations. That's what's happening. There's a, a battle there for the mind of men and women. And Paul's, and, and the scriptures tell us the way God opens the eyes of those who sit in blinds is through the preaching of the word of God. The preaching of the word of God as we explain the truth of God. That's what's happening. And so take it up. Prioritize preaching. Understand what the event is. You know, sometimes theologians used to say, the preaching of the word of God is the word of God. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a heavy thing to say. That's not to say that everything a preacher says is accurate or right, but that when a preacher is saying that which is consistent with the scriptures, you have God speaking to you. And the key reason why that's true, why I think that's true, is because Paul tells us here, is the spirit is how the spirit works. So remember that the Holy Spirit is not the sword. It's the sword of the spirit. Remember that the Holy Spirit, the sword is the word of God. The Holy Spirit is not in that sense then the word of God. He's not the Bible. He's not the proclamation. But he attends to it. He binds himself to it. The preaching of the word. And so that if we desire to see the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, there's no greater place to see it perhaps than in the preaching of the word. The Spirit promises to attend to the preaching. I, I, as I say, I think this is primarily when the, as the gospel is preached. But there's no reason to think that this is not true about just the event of preaching itself. Paul is saying here that when the church is allowed to speak, you know, um, the church is allowed to, to declare the kingship of Jesus, Satan's works are destroyed. And what that tells us is this is a, it's a spiritual thing. This is a, it's a spiritual, a spiritual warfare. So it's not merely that someone is refusing 
to become a Christian simply because they're not convinced by your arguments or the preacher's articulation or the preacher's, uh, the way he structured his argument. I'm not saying those things are not important, but there is something deeper there. Satan has the mind. And there, imagine that in the event of preaching and sharing the gospel with someone, there are thoughts, there are perspectives, there are feelings that Satan would induce and implant, which only the Holy Spirit can expose through preaching. That no amount of rhetoric, no amount of arguing will argue someone out of. Um, and not even, and it's not, it's certainly not even in the style of preacher, of preaching. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the church having various styles of preaching. And the Lord uses, I believe the Holy Spirit will just use the gifts. Some people are calm in the way they approach one. You know, I was, I was watching a sermon the other day and this guy was, I won't say who it was, but he, he's a preacher and he's known to be just very calm, stationary, not, mon- not boring or monotone, but quite calm in his presentation. This is over two days. I watched him yesterday, watched his preacher yesterday. Amazing sermon. He's always given amazing sermons. He's an amazing thinker. He presented his perspective. And I, it, was, it was a YouTube video. And on the comment, someone said, oh, you know, this is how preaching should be. No shouting, no dramatics, no, no, all this walking, just straight to the word. It cut me a bit. And then, but I'd watched another sermon the day before. This was a black American preacher. And he was a black American preacher. Do you know what I'm saying? And he was singing, hands up, energy. The congregation had energy. And, but he was preaching the word of God. He was preaching the word. And, you know, both styles bless my soul. I, that's, that man's calm and serene style, it bless my soul. But that man's singing and his lively style, uh, that bless my soul too. I needed both. It's, it was, it's, it's the word that was crucial. And none of those styles in and of themselves are able to destroy the works of Satan. If a soul comes into the church, you can't say, oh, it's because the preaching was in the style of this, you know, lively, and it was off-putting, and that's why this soul wasn't delivered. That's why this person wasn't freed from the power of Satan. And you can't say, oh, if the, if the star was just, the star was so calm, and you need to scream more, because that's what, you, could, you can scream the devils out of these people. No, it's, it's, it doesn't work that way. There is something far deeper happening than even what the mortal eye can see. I'm not saying that we ignore outward things. We should present well and we should, um, we should be thoughtful and we shouldn't be weird or strange and things, but really there's something deeper. The Holy Spirit has to empower the preaching. He has to empower the preaching. This is a good thing, by the way. It's a good thing. It's a good thing that it doesn't depend on us doesn't depend on our delivery, doesn't depend on our eloquence, the Holy Spirit. You know, the Bible says he searches the mind of God. That means he knows everything, everything. He knows that what's really stopping that person from committing to Jesus is greed. It's actually greed or it's pride. So what does that mean? It means the Holy Spirit can take the words in preaching He can guide our preaching and make sure that's the very thing we address. He can make sure that that's how that comes out in the gospel presentation. As the preacher is declaring that every soul needs Jesus. And that our souls are empty without Jesus. And that we're by nature the children of wrath. And that the reason why Christ came to die is because regardless of your record and whatever you think your record is outside of Christ, the wrath of God is upon you. And that you might think that you need to be saved from Satan, that's true, but you've actually your biggest problem is that you need to be saved from 
God himself. God's wrath. God's righteous judgment. Jesus died to reconcile you to God. To make a way for you to come back to God. He died for that so that you can now approach God's presence with boldness. Don't you see that the reason why you don't love God's presence and the reason why you are hesitant about church and the reason why you're staggering to church is because there's guilt and you feel that you're not worthy of being in the presence of the holy. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians. If that church, if they gather themselves properly and they speak in, and there's order in their service and they speak prophetically, He says, even the unbeliever might come and see that there's God among you. Okay? And the Holy Spirit can take the truth and make it known to the heart. Remember that. We must preach the gospel for that reason. He's the one at work. He can make a man or a woman see how much they need to be reconciled to God. Like in ways you cannot imagine. All of a sudden, he just hits them. I need to be, I need to be back with God. I thought my biggest problem was that I needed my friends, or I needed to, to repair my relationship with my parents. So now I'm feeling, I'm feeling that. But on ten, I need to be reconciled with God. The Holy Spirit does that. The atonement, he can make the atonement beautiful. You know, people today, they mock the idea of the atonement. Oh, man, you know, how, how can someone just die and take someone else's place and oh, this, all this Christian? But trust me, as we proclaim, that's what Satan has done. Satan said, oh, isn't this thing obsolete? Does this thing even make sense? Who still believes in sacrifice? But I'm telling you, we preach, and all of a sudden, someone is crying out, nothing but the blood. Wash me, cleanse me in your blood. The digital age that... How many of us have ever seen an animal um, animal killed? Maybe when you went to Africa sometime, a long time ago. Otherwise, maybe some of you have never seen any... You see blood, you start to shake. You can't see, you don't... We're not used to blood. And yet, in all our digitalness, believe me, in this, whatever the generation is, that's why... I don't, have, I, don't get, I don't insult generations because these are the elect of God. Whether you're Gen Z or Boomer or whatever they call you. The chosen of God. God has his people there. And let th- no one deceive you that Gen Z won't cry out for the blood. They might never see an animal sacrifice in their life. But they will say, wash me in his blood. I love, I need the blood of Jesus. Cleanse me. They will say, the sacrifice of Jesus is all I have. All people will say that. All nations will say that. It's the Holy Spirit that does that. He he makes a man who has never seen a lamb slain see the lamb who was slain. He was crucified for me. He was broken for me. It happens when the Spirit takes preaching. He takes it and he opens our eyes to see things that Satan had tried to blind us from. The sword of the Spirit is the preaching of the word of God. Because those men and women who hear that, they now surrender to Jesus. They say, I've decided to follow Jesus. And Jesus is the one, you know how powerful his word is. He spoke to the, the tomb of Lazarus and said, come forth. So guess what? When the word is shouting, the world is shouting its ideas. Think this way, see this way, feel this way. Jesus speaks and his voice is louder. And it's truer and it's purer. And although the world comes, the, the person says, I have decided to follow Jesus. And Satan just sees all the chains that he's tried to put. They're just falling apart. He can't. He's, this is another soul that has been won. And you know what Christians are? They're lights. And so now you turn on another light and it overcomes the darkness. It overcomes the darkness. And it all begins because the Holy Spirit blesses preaching. What should be our response? Each piece put on with prayer. We have to pray. You know, Paul says here, this is one of the most robust statements of the necessity of prayerfulness you'll ever come across. The apostle says, praying every single time in the Spirit 
pray at all times. With all kinds of prayer. I was saying it this morning. That's what Paul was saying. All kinds of prayer. Long ones, short ones. The ones in fasting. The ones when you're very too full. Prayer on the way to work. Prayer with your eyes closed. Prayer with your eyes open. Pray, pray, pray. You just pray to God. Spoken loud prayers. Prayers where you cry, you scream to God. Prayers where people hear you next door. Prayers where you whisper. Prayers that are just in the mind. No one can see that you're praying. Prayers where the mouth moves and nothing is being heard. Someone thinks you're, is he okay? Is he crazy? I'm in prayer to God though. I'm praying. Prayer with my friends. Prayer with others. Prayers in the church. All kinds of prayer. And he says, to that end, look at verse 16. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication. He says, be careful to make sure that prayer is central. To that end, keep alert. You will not pray like this if you don't have vigilance about it. One of the practical ways we try to do this here is just to keep our prayer meeting going. 7.30 7.30 p.m. Thursdays. We just keep it as a... Wherever you... We have... You know, church... Life can be busy. We can have so many meetings at church, but we just have to keep a prayer meeting going. I'm not saying everyone has to do that. I'm just saying it's one practical way to make sure that you don't lose the opportunity to pray. You keep alert with all vigilance. And here's the point. Paul says, Pray for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim Paul says pray for the preaching because he knows it's the Holy Spirit who does the work brothers and sisters if we realize that spiritual warfare is not about us but about the victory of Jesus if we know that what we're doing is we are we are witnessing the victory of Christ over Satan then one of the things we'll be doing is praying for preaching I want to see Jesus lifted high I want to see him exalted I know he's coming. I know he's going to um, overthrow his enemies. I know he'll put all his enemies under his feet. I know that every knee will bow and every tongue confess. I just want to see it. I love it. I love him. He's worthy. He's worthy of all praise. Worthy is the name of Jesus. I just want to exalt him. I just want him to be celebrated. I know he deserves all the glory. He alone deserves all the glory. I know that's what the meaning of life is. Every atom, every molecule is chanting his praise. I know he is worthy. And so now I just, I want to exalt him. And nothing, maybe nothing shows that more, my brothers and sisters, than praying for the spread of the gospel. Pray that God would raise preachers. Pray for other churches. That's why it's so sad when Christians fight over the most uh, uh, unimportant things. Things that don't matter as much. Things that don't need to divide us. Things that don't affect the proclamation of the gospel. Because we should be praying for each other's churches. And whatever denomination you're known by. Reform, Pentecostal, uh, whatever you choose to call yourself. Method, Methodist, Baptist. Paulist, whatever you call yourself, if you're proclaim, proclaiming the gospel, we pray for each other. We thank God that we're witnessing the destruction of Satan's kingdom. And I pray for them. And I pray for the people you call to preach there, Lord. And we pray for you to raise more. And you pray for people who proclaim boldly. So what, what it does mean is when we see people who are proclaiming the gospel feebly, men who have... You know, I, I see some guys on YouTube. I'm not jealous, you know, but I see people on YouTube and they got like hundreds of thousands of views in their YouTube page or their YouTube sermons. And I listen to the sermon from beginning to the end and I think it must be the drip. It must be the drip. It's, it can't, it's not the word. And that's, so, that's heartbreaking. It's heart-wrenching. I don't care what drip a man has if he proclaimed the gospel. I will, if he's proclaiming the gospel, I'll even send him air forces. I'll send, what does he want to do? I'll send it to him. If he's going to preach Christ and preach him crucified. And I think if that was 
100,000 views, 200,000 views of people hearing that Jesus is Lord and the cross alone saves and you must repent and trust Jesus to be safe from the wrath to come. What a wasted platform. And so we have to pray, Lord, open the eyes of those who are in this deception. Expose some of these ministries and or, or revive your people you know, if you see churches, hundreds of churches of believers, but they're not preaching the right thing. These are Christians. These are believers. Oh, Lord, revive them. Stir them up. Unsettle them. Because if all these pockets of Christians start to do the right thing, proclaim the word of God, we're going to see Satan's kingdom destroyed. Well, let me close just by saying this, brothers and sisters. The great reminder that Paul wants to give to the church in Ephesus. Although he's telling us all the items of warfare, the weapons, pick them up, pick up the belt of truth. Pick, he's saying that and he, and he wants us and he's warning us about the, the adversity we face as Christians and that you know, for our entire duration on this world we'll be in warfare. Remember that our Lord was victorious on Calvary. The battle is the Lord's and he has won the day. And the fact that you and I are alert to warfare because we have faith in the word of God is the evidence that we need that we will overcome, that we have been victorious. I can say this to you. If you will take on the armor of God, if you listen carefully to the words of the apostle, if you're putting your trust in Jesus alone, I can say this to you without equivocation about this warfare. It might feel hard. It might feel relentless. It might feel tiresome. You might sometimes feel afraid. But if you are someone who is trusting in Jesus and thus you are putting on the armor of God, what Paul is calling you to do is to walk in your victory. Jesus has won. Walk in that victory. Amen.